This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. My guest today is Peter Becky. He's an American economist of the Austrian school. Currently a university professor of economics and philosophy at George Mason University. Yes, that's my alma mater. And yes, I keep dipping into the well to bring on the very, very Austrian, libertarian, Hayek, Friedman, etc., influenced economist from my alma mater. Because George Mason University in the United States of America is the leader right now for this style of thinking, this style of economics. Today, Peter and I cover a wide scope in his world with a special focus on F.A. Hayek. In fact, his newest book titled F.A. Hayek is out now and worth checking out. You know, every generation has to relearn or to understand for the first time how things should work, how things really do work. Because if we don't, we end up with all the young people in America running around saying they want socialism and they want government handouts and all this other nonsense. So I love the fact that I get the chance to bring on people like Peter and his associates at George Mason and many of his associates that are not at George Mason University, I love to bring them on to this show because you know what? They talk so straight, so clear, so pure, so logical. You just walk away and you say, my gosh, how can the world go any other direction? And any other direction just doesn't make sense because these guys, like Peter, they've done the homework, they've done the research, they've laid it all out, and it's up to us to jump back in and see what we can learn from them. Without further delay, let me jump into my guest today, Peter Becky of George Mason University. Peter, we've got this guy in the presidency. And you know, I'm calling you from Asia today and there's a lot of news conversations. And I look, you've got a really wide perspective. So I want you to put your best professorial hat on as you give your explanations, because a lot of people don't really pay attention or they don't really know what's going on. But you know, you start to hear these conversations today about trade wars and tariffs. Now, my first thought would be, okay, if you're gonna talk about trade wars and tariffs, how many different tariffs are there already? Because I don't even know what the baseline is. But what do you start to think about and where are we right now? Are we going in a good direction or a bad direction when we start to hear the president of the United States talking about a trade war, talking about tariffs and specifically with China? What's your feeling? What's your perspective right now? So the whole Trump phenomena is an amazing showmanship act and one of keeping people off balance. I grew up outside of New York City in New Jersey. And during the era of Donald Trump. And so both my wife and I come from there and my family. And so we've all known about Trump and his shenanigans since I was a kid. It's never something to look up to. It's always just a a big show. And he, you know, wrote a book many, many years ago called The Art of the Deal. It's the classic anti basic economics book. He doesn't believe in mutually beneficial exchange. He thinks exchange is a zero sum game and there's winners and there's losers and, you know, and he has to be on the winning side and others are going to lose in that. And so, you know, one way to look at what he's doing with these different trade rhetoric is that he's either fulfilling his older ideology, which is a zero sum world, or he's engaged in hard negotiation tactics, right? It's unclear because, you know, there's this giant show going on and then who knows what's going on while the distraction is going on over here because, you know, again, he was a New York City real estate guy and his whole view is to try to create chaos so he can operate on the margins within inside the chaos and get 
better deals for himself. Who knows? The rhetoric is horrible. The rhetoric that Trump has on so many issues, whether or not his actual policies that get passed, some of which have been horrific, I would argue, and others of which have been pretty good. So the record is a little mixed at the moment if you step back from the rhetoric. But the rhetoric has really caused problems, I think. Well, let me take this to something kind of tangible and specific, kind of a really big picture thing that I think most of the audience, whether versed in your type of world or not, would get. So we look at Amazon, such tremendous success, you know, and they're giving everybody in America every good and service they could possibly want at a price people seem to be happy with. And lo and behold, look what happens to the stock price. So map out for me, is there something inherently wrong right now with the concept of Amazon, which is obviously being fueled to a large degree by products that are being produced in China. So China is benefiting by giving Americans these products they want at lower prices. Is there something wrong in this whole narrative? Is, is there something that Trump sees about what China is doing that needs to be fixed? W what am I missing here? Well, I mean, you know, there's these classic stories about what trade deficits are and whether or not trade deficits are important to worry about. Uh, this goes with the whole Trump zero sumness issue, as opposed to the idea of the mutually beneficial aspects of exchange. There are, of course, obvious difficulties in some of these places having to do with the respect of intellectual property rights. If you believe that intellectual property should be protected and other kinds of issues associated with manipulation of, of various things for political purposes. But, and obviously whether or not regimes are free and, and open and other kinds of things that are non-economics that you worry about. But the reality is, is that, you know, Amazon has made our lives immensely better. There is a kind of nostalgia for mom and pop stores. You hear this sometimes when local bookstores complain about them getting eliminated. You know, used to have, you know, mom, pop bookstore on the corner that had coffee in it and you went and got your books and looked through your used books or whatever. And now you just go on Amazon and, you know, the next day a package is delivered with your book there and you drink your coffee in your own house and you got it for much less than you would have if you gone to this mom, pop bookstore. And there's this complaint that, you know, oh, we're losing this experience or whatever, and this is our community. And so you'll hear on NPR or whatever, you know, these debates, and then people will have to admit, well, but Amazon gives me greater variety at a lower cost, right? And so when I'm going to look for books or records or whatever else I'm looking for, what do I want? Greater variety and at a lower cost. And so Amazon has done amazing. Now, whether or not Amazon now is also making shifts into like Microsoft did into being more of a political beast than it was just a market participant. That's the nature of our politics and that's one of the real problems. And so Bezos is now, you know, in this world of trying to engage in rent protection and rent seeking. And once you start doing that, then politics encroaches into the evolution of the way that markets evolve, and then you get these distortions. But I think that Trump and the rhetoric of our time has made the zero sumness be very much on people's minds. And so they look at stuff and that's what you see going on. Bezos and rent seeking. Why don't you first define rent seeking from your standpoint? I've seen you joke before in other presentations where you, you've you had to define it. People didn't necessarily get it, but why don't you define rent seeking? And then why don't you, because I'm curious too, why don't you explain where you're seeing that with Bezos? Obviously, Bezos owns the Washington Post, which is as political as it comes, but what specifically you're seeing with Bezos? First define it and then let me hear your view. What you referred to is I gave a talk once at a college and a woman, an elderly woman came up to me afterwards and said, uh, Professor, that was the best talk I've ever heard in my life. Thank you so much. I didn't realize it was all the landlord's fault. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, no. Uh, rent seeking is a kind of a technical term in economics. The easiest way to translate it would be get rid of the term rent and just substitute in privilege, privilege seeking. The reason why it's called a rent is because that's the monopoly profits that you get from the privilege. 
that's one way to define the rent that you've created in economic terms, as opposed to a profit, which would just be on the market. By creating an artificial monopoly, you end up by earning these rents. Privilege seeking is what's going on. So Bezos has evolved this business. It's it's an amazing business. He does own the Washington Post. That's again, you know, that's more the media aspects, but he now is becoming more and more involved in politics and making sure that if there's going to be various regulations that he will be at the table for the regulators, just like Zuckerberg and just like before him, you know, Gates. You know, Microsoft 25 years ago had no presence in Washington, D.C. Now it has this giant presence in Washington, D.C. And so I think that one way to look at all this stuff is when people migrate to Washington, D.C., there's a reason for it. And it's not because of the inherently good cuisine or the nice weather or anything else. It's just the fact that this is the place where you go and get privileges. They spend a lot of money on trying to make sure that they do that. And we as economists, we study that. That's like a market that we want to study, the market for privileges. And so we spend a lot of time thinking about those kind of things. I think this would be a great place to jump off with a little bit about you because you've just raised some interesting issues involving names that we all know. So for those listening, first they hear a criticism of Trump. Okay, that's going to cause my Trump listeners to think, Oh, I don't know. I don't like I don't I don't know. I don't like this guy. Right. Right. But then hold on. Within a few minutes, you're now nailing Bezos. And then you're going to hold on. The Bezos people are. So I think it'd be a good point to start to outline your philosophy, an economist from the Austrian school. Now, that is not something you typically hear on the nightly news. You don't really typically hear it on CNBC anymore. So while the floor is yours, Professor. I want you to define to the best that you can for my audience, assuming they could be smart or not so smart an economics professor in the Austrian school. Well, I mean, I'm an economist first and foremost, but I find the economists that I am most persuaded by to be economists that come from a particular tradition of economics. Usually schools of thought are names given by their opponents, okay? So normally, you know, if you're just practicing economics, just like as you're practicing physics, you wouldn't run around and say, oh, I practice United States physics, right? <laughs> or Chinese physics. You would just, I'm a, phys I, I practice physics. And then someone, you know, from another country that doesn't like what you're saying might say, oh, that's just those Chinese physicists, or that's just those United States or Canadian physicists. They must be different. And that's what happened with the Austrian School of Economics back in the 19th century at the University of Vienna. There's a man named Karl Menger, and he's one of the original founders of modern neoclassical economics, the German historical school who dominated German language economics. They did not believe in classical economics, and they didn't like the emerging neoclassical economics, but they dominated the German academic scene, and Menger comes along, and they just said, oh, that's that Austrian economist who wants to stress economic theory against our gathering of historical facts. That's where the origin of the name comes, and then you have these various people that followed in the footsteps of Menger in a first generation, uh, a man named von Bavrik, who was one of the leading economists in the world, along with Alfred Marshall and John Bates Clark in the 1890s. And then into the 20th century, you have Joseph Schumpeter and Ludwig von Mises. Schumpeter's famous for his emphasis on the entrepreneurial economy and the notion of creative destruction. Uh, and Mises is famous for his critique of socialism and that socialism could not engage in economic, rational economic calculation because the absence of private property would eliminate the prices and profit and loss signals that are necessary for economic coordination and development. And then out of Schumpeter and, and Mises, the next generation, you get Hayek, Friedrich Hayek, who's a Nobel Prize winner in economics. And he emphasized a lot of the same things I've been talking about from Mises and Schumpeter, but also the importance of the institutional infrastructure within which economic activity develops and, and is played out. And that's what led to books of his like 
the Constitution of Liberty, which is really about the rule of law and how you need to have a rule of law and the evolution of these institutions to be able to have a vibrant economy. And Hayek then influenced American thinkers such as James Buchanan, who was at George Mason and was one of my teachers. And then I was gone for 10 years. And then I came back to George Mason and James Buchanan won the Nobel Prize in 1986. And he's famous for what's called constitutional economics and Buchanan's most important contributions related to what we were touching on before a little bit is actually related to the real problem of debts and deficits, which is the public deficit and the accumulation of public debt. And Buchanan's basic insight there was that politicians have a very, very strong incentive to run deficits because they're going to concentrate benefits on the well-organized and well-informed interest groups in the current period and disperse the costs on the unorganized and ill-informed mass of voters in the future periods. This is leads to this bias towards deficit financing, and that's what we've seen played out in, say, the last six decades in the United States, but pretty much across all the social democratic states since World War II. The only way that you can constrain that is, is, as Buchanan argues, is if you have constitutional restrictions on these. So I hope that that is a somewhat of an intelligible presentation. No, you've just given people a ton of books they have to go buy, that's for sure. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey, so let's, let me take it back a little bit further, though. What I would love from you, and you've got so many great presentations on YouTube, but I would love for you to kind of, what's the trigger point? Give me the age as a young man. What was the point, the moment, even if you weren't necessarily knowledgeable of all the names and insights that you just mentioned. What's that point that triggered you and you said, I'm going this direction for the rest of my life? What was it? Well, it's a little bit of a complicated story. I did not go to college with any expectations of being an academic or even a student of any seriousness. I went to college because I wanted to play basketball. I grew up in New Jersey and I spent a lot of my time in the playgrounds playing basketball is what you did back then to try to get better to play in college. I went off to a college to play and I got hurt and whatnot. And so I was going to transfer to another college to play. And I got a job that summer because I had a deal with my dad that as long as I was continuing to work on my sports, I didn't have to have summer jobs because I spent all my time, you know, training and everything. But because I, I gave up a partial scholarship at the one school to transfer to another school, my dad said that I had to like get the money to be able to pay for, you know, my spending money and everything like that. And so I got a job, but where was I going to get a job? So I got a job from guys at the playground who told me about this job digging pools. I joined this staff to dig pools, and it was the late 1970s. Now, why is that important is because that was a period of high inflation, very hard to get jobs, high unemployment, but also gas lines. It's hard for young people to remember this, but what we had at the time was a gas shortage in the United States, and they put a cap on how much you could put in your tank. And this is important because for the digging the pools, one of the things that they wanted to do was they had two trucks and they didn't want to waste all the time waiting on the gas lines. So they would fill the trucks up in the beginning of the week and then you would siphon the gasoline from the one truck to the other truck. And then they'd leave the truck behind that you used to get the gas so that they so people that were not digging the pools could go in and fill the, the truck up and wait online. Well, I was the youngest person at the crew, so I was in charge of starting the siphoning of the gasoline. And anyone who knows what you do to do that, you stick a tube into a gas tank and you start sucking on it until the things – I hated it. It was terrible. And this job was killing me. I mean, I was like – I just hated it. It was hard work digging pools and, and working with these guys and like that. And my girlfriend, now wife, I would go see her at the end of the day and she had a neighbor across the street. And that neighbor told me halfway through the summer that I could get a job at electric factory. 
And would I like to go do that? And I said, sure. So I had to give notice to the guy. Now I'm from New Jersey. This is important to keep in mind. So this pool digging company was actually a front for some other business that was going on. We've all seen the Sopranos. Yes, right. Exactly. And that's actually who the guy was who ran the company. And I told him, I gave him notice and I said, I, you know, hey, I'm, I'm going to be working at this other job. So you know how you get paid on a stagger, right? You don't get paid right away. So I had to go back the next week to get my pay. I had to interrupt the guy and it was, you know, a whole bunch of shenanigans going on. But he goes back to get me my cash and he hands me my cash for the week rather than a check. And when he hands me the cash, he then stops, grabs it out of my hand and says, I got to take withholding out and then takes the money and then hands me back some less cash. You know, I was a stupid kid. So when I got my check every week, I never even realized I was getting withholding out. But now all of a sudden I got this direct withholding that he said he had to take because, it was, you know, that was the government was making him do that. All right. So as that is background, I go off to Grove City College and I'm sitting in a class and, you know, Senhol, Mahan, my professor Hans Senholtz is up there and he starts talking about the gas lines. And the first thing he explains is why is it we have these gas lines that characterize the United States at the moment? And he explains that this is because of price controls that are set by the government on gasoline. And I'm like, Son of a gun. That's why I was, you know, having to siphon gasoline. The damn government set a price control on it. This is horrible. And then he starts talking about, you know, taxation and, and, and taxation as taking of resources from individuals. And I'm like, no crap. That's exactly what that guy did to me in that office. He took that money from me. And that's the government's fault, too. And I said, geez, I got to study this because I don't want to end up having to siphon gasoline the rest of my life or have people take my resources from me. And I just got hooked on studying economics. And then I started studying economics like all the time. I continued to play sports all the way through college. In fact, when I got out of college, I actually worked in the sports field for a year before I went to graduate school. But every spare moment I had, I was reading economics. People would come up to me and say, like, what are you reading? And, you know, they expect me to be reading, you know, the latest summer enjoyable book or whatever. And instead I'm reading Henry Hazlitt or Hayek or, you know, Mises. And they're like, what the hell are you reading? You know? And so I, I realized I had to go to graduate school. And for me, going to graduate school wasn't a, like a career decision. It literally was like, this is what I had to do because I had to study these ideas even more and more because, again, I was so taken by the beauty of the intellectual apparatus of economics. And I was taken by the importance of the message of economics. And so that's how I ended up by being where I am today. So here you are as a young guy having these few interesting experiences to see the government in action to feel the negative for you as an individual. And I can flip, I can flip on the news today. I can go to any social media outlet and it appears to me, and look, you're a professor, so you probably see, well, maybe not in your economics department, but so many young people today are like literally running around with their heads chopped off, screaming they want socialism. Now, I really don't think if they knew what you knew, if they're a semi-intelligent person and they can see the choices between what Peter is advocating and what Bernie Sanders is advocating or the, or the crazy lady that just won up there in New York or Brooklyn, I don't think they would choose the socialism side. But they've got this direction that they're pushing. It's so entirely different than your direction. Do you sometimes just wonder, are you like in the twilight zone? You can either get very frustrated or you can get very fascinated. I like to choose to be more fascinated as to why young people don't see opportunities. Now, so I think it was quite obvious, maybe in retrospect during my youth, that there was something wrong with the way the government was doing things that now people think that it's obvious that something's wrong with the way businesses are doing things. But let me come back to that because 
at the time, you know, again, 19, late 1970s, if you want to capture some of this, look at the movie Miracle, which is about the U.S. hockey team beating the, the Soviet team. It was clear that the Soviets were the bad guys, right? So think about the movies from that period of time, you know, from Miracle, you know, about that period of time, Miracle, or at that time, like Red Dawn, <laughs> right, with Patrick Swayze. I remember Red Dawn. Red Dawn, <laughs> Rocky. Not only Rocky, but then also, what's the other thing Sylvester Stallone Rambo, did? Rambo, Rambo. You know, when he takes on the Russian MiGs, the thing with Tom Cruise, the top flight or whatever, right? Top Gun. You know, there's all always facing down the sort of Soviet superpower that is trying to oppress people. And, you know, the Americans are, you know, this is the imagery that we're selling at the time. I think I was unusual in the sense that I processed all this and became an economist. But I think the imagery that young people have today is that their economic opportunities have been slashed, that their rights have been trampled on or they feel offended and whatnot, and that the source of that is the privileged few who, for example, have, like in the financial crisis, didn't get wiped out, but instead were given bailouts. And, and whatnot. And so I think there's a kind of anger. They grew, they've grown up in a period of time where the United States has been at war for 16 years or more. And so they stare at this. And if you think that the basic message, you asked about my politics, I don't really belong to any political party, but my politics is really, you know, don't hurt people and don't take their stuff and basically let people live and let live was my basic view. We're neighbors with one another and we bump into each other and we need to find rules that allow us to live better together than we ever could in our isolation. And that's kind of my basic politics. And I think right now people are seeing everyone as hurting people and taking stuff from them and their neighbors that are bumping into each other and unwilling to compromise to find rules. And so they're angry. And I can't really understand or appreciate completely their anger but I want to, and I want to see what it is because conversations, you know, always begin where the other person is. And then you have to bring them to your position and listen and learn in the process. And so I would love to reach out to young people that are outraged about the current system and really find out what it is that's bothering them about the possibilities. And I think- Let me play devil's advocate for a second. So if I'm a young person today, first off, I've got Amazon but I can also create a, I, I can create a website in a moment's notice. I can be selling something almost immediately, okay? So, so we can make excuses for young people that wanna say, there's no pie for me left. We could also, I know plenty of young people that would say, hey, hold on, there's a lot of pie. There's another issue here though, and I wanna quote from Hayek actually about this. And this is the part that I think really drives me crazy today. This is a quote from Hayek, quote, the propaganda destroys morality by attacking the very basis of all morality, the meaning and respect for the truth, end quote. And you know, I, I find today, whether it's particular politicians, and we could probably find them on the left and the right, but especially the media, that, that you know, there's, there's different types of biases in, in, on different platforms and different media circles, but there's definitely a media bias right now in the States that is saying either loudly and proudly, or it's kind of a woven into, into all of their narratives, but it's kind of trust the government, the government is good for you, and when the government gives you some applesauce to eat, open your mouth and say, yes, sir, or thank you, can I have some more? Where is this, this whole thing that the government is the savior is really, that's the part that drives me crazy with the young people. You and I are in agreement on that. You should have put a qualifier in there about trust the government. Trust the government when it does the things I want it to do. <laughs> when it does things I don't want it to do, then all of a sudden the government is, you know, this evil beast that's controlled by these evil forces or whatever. I have a book manuscript, which I probably will never publish, but I've been working on it. And it's called The Consequences of Philosophical BS. And... <laughs> And, and part of this is the fact, this is why Steven Pinker's Enlightenment Now or Han, Hans Reisling's, you know, factfulness are so important because there's sort of basic reason and evidence which is being discounted 
on universities and in the, our culture and in our media tremendously. And we need to somehow get back to agreement to the idea of what reason and evidence can bring to bear in the world. So we don't want to have feelings and emotion driving everything. We want reason and evidence to be driving a lot of these inf you know, infrastructure questions. I don't mean infrastructure like roads and stuff. I mean the institutions under which we operate and exist. So the point that you raised about Hayek and propaganda is 100% correct. If you erode the basic morality of which we interact with each other, we shouldn't be surprised when the society starts to fray apart. And so how do I get back to that understanding of the reason and evidence that is necessary to understand the importance of private property, the rule of law, freedom of contract, freedom of association, freedom of thought and conscience and these kind of questions. And how do I have that kind of protected in some kind of constitutional order? These questions are, of course, but they're all frayed at the moment. And so my point earlier was I'm trying to figure out, like, what is it that has happened? Because one of the things that's really important in the United States to keep in mind, and maybe one of the reasons why you relocated was precisely because the United States used to promise its young people that we were a society of meritocracy. What mattered is what you did, not who you knew. It always was the case, by the way, that you know, knowing people mattered, but it wasn't the, the, the main governing idea. And there is a sense in which we have become more of a connection-based economy because of the massive involvement of the government in our economic lives, the ability to get privileges and protection of existing privileges. That becomes more that we're sort of seeing people rather than going making a go of things, we're seeing more and more people sort of mix their economic lives with their political lives, and that creates barriers. And so one of the things we've seen is a decline in the mobility between income quintiles. We still are very mobile society, but we have seen a slowing of that ability to move between the quintiles. And these are kind of questions that we have to ask ourselves, like what are the structural difficulties that people are facing in moving between that as opposed to what you mentioned before, we should actually see because of technology a speeding up of those movement between the quintiles because my God, now with a iPad and, a, and an app, I can start a business. I can, you know, give a go. What are we going here? But if the rise of regulation has caused problems, if various other government distortions have caused problems, then maybe my $2 app doesn't allow me to enter in as much as I once did. And my vision becomes restricted. And it's when that entrepreneurial vision becomes restricted that your society becomes just slightly less vibrant. And when societies become less vibrant, then the pinch of government stupidity gets even stronger on them. For those that don't know, I think it's six, six of the top 10 wealthiest counties in the United States of America surround Washington, D.C. There's, there's nothing that you and I can say about that except to say that that is a very sad statement. At one point, it was eight. After the financial crisis, it had risen to eight. So, you know, and again, you grew up in this area. You're old enough to, to be pre-9-11. When I lived here in the 1980s, Washington, D.C. was a very sleepy place compared to New York City, where I grew up outside of or compared to Boston or San Francisco. And so I lived in San Francisco area for a year as well in the early 90s when I was at Stanford. Washington, D.C. was nothing like that. I come back in, the, in 1998 and Washington, D.C. Is, is, you know, it's improved a lot. But after September 11th, everyone moved to Washington to fix the world's problems, right? And then after the financial crisis, everyone moves to Washington, D.C. to fix the world's problems again. And what you see is Loudoun County and Fairfax and all these places just explode in wealth. And as someone who lived here, by the way, and I lived right outside the Beltway, I now live a little further out, my house never suffered a housing crisis. Northern Virginia was protected. I mean, you know, I was- yeah, uh... My family out in New Jersey, their housing values fell tremendously or whatever. 
I never experienced that because the house that I had in Fairfax actually kept on going up in price. And, and, you know, so you're trying to process as an economist, you know, you think about these things, you're trying to process, okay, so, you know, what's going on with the supply and demand dynamics here, you know, it's just an amazing thing. So Washington DC has become a very interesting place to live in, in terms of just your everyday social life and, you know, better restaurants, better range of opportunities and, and things like that. But the rest of the country, you know, that has had some real problems and we should be thinking about that. Just like what you said, it's kind of when Washington DC or the area around the seat of government becomes your main wealth displayer, you should actually scratch your head a little bit and say, like, what the hell's going on? You know, you brought up prices indirectly. Let's talk about Hayek and prices. I, in prepping to chat with you, I went down a, the rabbit hole of some Friedman interview, and he got to talking about Hayek and prices. And, you know, I've actually written a couple books about trading, trading strategies that specifically revolve around price movement, basically momentum. And so I find it really fascinating in the Austrian world the concept of prices. It's such a beautiful, simple notion, like exchange, a market. How do two people that don't know each other, how can they trust each other? And it really, that that basic building block, the market price discovery, uh, gosh, that's just, it's stuff that I think we often lose sight of. I think there's a really basic sort of intuition aspect of what prices serve in an economy. You know, there are these terms of exchange that we face. They also reflect the mutually beneficial aspect. I go out of the milk store and I buy my gallon of milk and I give my dollars over and we both say thank you, right? The shop owner says, thank you for giving me the money. And I say, thank you for giving me the milk. And so that's a mutually beneficial exchange. What happens in our teaching of economics, unfortunately, a lot of times is that we don't communicate enough to our students the power of prices. What we do is we give them the reality that prices are the summaries of these activity that ends, but we don't focus to them on the role that prices play in guiding and in directing the adaptation and constant changing constellation of economic opportunities. And what Hayek really wanted to do was focus on that aspect of prices, prices as guides to exchange and production activity, as opposed to prices as summaries of previous costs. Follow the price will lead you to somewhere where economic activity is going. Right. And so like for yourself as a trader, yeah, what you care about is what's going to happen tomorrow, not what happened yesterday. What happened yesterday only to the extent that it helps me get a better sense of where I'm going to be tomorrow so that I can anticipate the market moves and try to be there first, right? That's how I'm going to I'm going to try to buy low and sell high. I want to avoid all situations where I buy high and have to sell low. And so this is the power that Hayek is getting us to think about is this adaptation and changing to the circumstances of the market. And by putting this emphasis on the prices, and I would say that what Hayek really does is he puts the emphasis on prices, the lure of profits, and the penalty of loss. So, you know, what we do is we we have a guide that help us steer our ship, and then we get signals that are sent back by either we, we're getting profits, which means that, you know, we did the right thing, or we end up by getting the penalty of losses, which means, oh man, I got to rethink about how it is that I judged what those prices were moving as, and I rearranged my behavior. And so the market is this constant entrepreneurial recognition of the opportunities that need to be pursued. And that's the beauty of the market is not that it's just so efficient. It is that the market competition is this efficiency generating machine. It it makes us want to produce things, like I said earlier about Amazon, at a lower cost and a better quality. And that's because if we don't do it, someone else is going to and beat us to the punch, right? So they are these efficiency generating machines. But what's fascinating to me intellectually and also personally as a benefactor of participating in the market economy is the constant adaptation and change to consumer tastes and technological innovations that just think about the evolution of cell phones. 
and what has happened. I carry around a cell phone with me right now that has more computing power on it than what the computer on the Apollo missions had, right? And I carry it around for two hundred dollars. How amazing is that? It's got more than what you had in the early 2000s. Yes, it's just amazing, right? That adaptation and constant change and adjustments that are guided by the price system, this is the beauty of the price system. This is what we have to get our students to understand about economics, not necessarily the optimality conditions of when economic forces have done all their work. Those are important intellectually to understand but what really happens is all the dynamics leading up to that conclusion. And I think once we recognize that, we would then start to see, oh, look at all these things that we benefit from. Well, maybe what we need to do is also start thinking about what are the institutions and policies that perpetuate this dynamic entrepreneurial economy that we rely on so much for our wealth creation. You know, we were talking a little bit about socialism before I had brought up Bernie. I would like for you to paint a picture. We've got these conversations in the States, for example, and there's probably plenty of Americans that truly cannot grasp the scope of economic development in China because they've never set foot there. And, and I don't know if I could unless I had set foot there. But when you set foot in China, you see something that's just... Titanic. I mean, it's just, it's an explosion of what we would otherwise call an America capitalism. But, but the government, the structure of the government there, a lot of the legal framework would not otherwise be something that we in America would be like, well, we don't really like that. But so almost in spite of themselves, or, you know, we probably, could, we could probably take it back to the kind of the baseline cultural ethic of many groups in Asia where they just have this merchant class mentality. But why don't you kind of contrast those two things for us? Because I mean, I could make the argument that, you know, you probably might kill me on this, but China called a, a socialist country might be undertaking more capitalism than the country that I'm from that's called the capitalist country. What is What is going on with all these labels? Well, it's one of the reasons why before I wasn't very articulate, but why I was talking about with the kids, like, and what's their frustration is actually, I want to listen to them because I want to identify the factors in the U.S. economy that are preventing for them to be able to pursue this kind of entrepreneurial vision, as opposed to where you see it in other places. So I have two quick things to say. One of them is that when the campaign was going on, I was still giving a lot of college talks, and at one of my talks, there was a group of kids in the front row, and they, they came there, and I'm sure they came there for a reason, looked me up, and then decided they were going to do this. They wore their Bernie shirts that said, feel the burn, right? And they sat in the, in the front row, and before I, as soon as I got done, they, their first question, a kid stood up, and he said, I want to know do you feel the burn? That's what the kid said to me about Bernie Sanders. And I said, and I stopped and I laughed for a second. I said, do you ever notice how in all other things in life, if I said to you, do you feel the burn that you would actually view that as a negative? <laughs> like if you fell and scraped your knee, that would be a burn. If you got heartburn, you know, after you ate like a spicy meal, like you would say, oh my God, I have the burn. I said, that's kind of how I feel about Bernie Sanders. The kid kind of laughed, but not really. But the China story that you told is a fascinating story because I think that in years to come, the analyst, the cool-headed analyst, will have to distinguish between Russia and China in the post-1989, 1991 period as follows. Hey, let me, interject one, let, me, let me interject one thing. You have a very extensive background in studying the economics of the former Soviet Union, correct? Right. As, yes, you, as, you, as you outline this story. <laughs> yeah. And, and so I think that what the deal is, is that China has had, since Tiananmen Square, has had very little de jure change with respect to the party and all these stuff like that. But they've had an immense amount of de facto change. That is that China has experienced a tremendous amount of decentralization. And a large part of that is if you study the history of the reforms from Deng Xiaoping all the way up to the present, 
you have the earlier period, which is 78 to 85, which in fact was a continued consolidation of the economic power. That didn't fix their problem. So then post-1985, what's happened is they gave a tremendous amount of power to these special economic zones, these regions and whatnot. And you've just seen tremendous flourishing in places like Shanghai, but also Guangdong and these other places, right? Whereas in Russia, you've had all of this de jure, that means official. De jure means official, de facto means unofficial. In, in Russia, you've had this tremendous amount of de jure changes but no real de facto changes. So the more things change, the more they stay the same. And as a result, you don't see the same kind of large contrast. We don't show pictures of Shanghai. You know, we do show pictures of Shanghai 25 years ago, 15 years ago, today, and you see it and you're like, oh my God, can you believe that development? We don't show that same picture for uh, Novosibirsk or something like that in Russia, right? Because if I showed a picture 25 years ago and I show it today, it looks the same. And so what's going on? So Russia claims that it has all these changes, but really they haven't. China claims they have no changes, but they really have. And so the analyst has to gonna sort that out and be able to explain all of this in the future. But right now in real time, it's hard for people to do that because everything is all caught up in like the, the day news cycle. And so getting that distance to be able to do that and the enough on the ground information to gather it from people like yourself that experience in the world, your experiences, which get written down in your discussions or listened to on your show are going to become data for future analysts 20 years from now, right? We're going to learn about how this economy actually is operating, how people have greater scope for entrepreneurial engagement, greater opportunities for expression and whatnot. Now, there's always, because the de facto changes are not backed by the de jure changes, there's always opportunities for a strong fist to come in and do something you know, that could upset the entire apple cart, but it's also the survival of the party is going to depend on the vibrancy of the economy. And so they don't want to kill the goose that lays the golden egg either. And so this is, this is one of the things that I think we really have to pay attention to. And so I hope that that this difference between the actual changes on the ground and the policy announcements and official statements, that disjoint is so important to study and understand. And I think we miss it all the time because we just focus on the official statements. Just to add an additional thought is that one thing that us as Americans, if we've not traveled to places like uh, China, Vietnam, even to, you know, Singapore, et cetera, but some of the countries that have adopted the socialist mentalities in Asia, we need to kind of keep in mind that they kind of, and I'm kind of generalizing a little here, but it, there's a little a lot of truth to this. They kind of became socialists because they needed a way to fend off colonial powers. So when you have these massive populations, they kind of figured out if they organized, they could fend off all of the colonial powers that were causing all kinds of problems across Asia. So I think that in many ways is how you get the structure of some of these governments. But to me, the most interesting thing about Asia is just the merchant mentality of people. Whereas in the States, I, I think people have kind of lost, not all, of course, I mean, Silicon Valley is amazing in many ways, but that that day-to-day -day hustle at every level of the economy, from the person that's selling street food, you know, all the way up the ladder, that merchant mentality in Asia, that deep desire to be rich, it's intoxicating Mr. and Mrs. America. <laughs> Yeah. Again, you know, uh, totalitarian regimes are horrible, but we live in, in worlds where- It's complicated. When those, yes. And where what we want to celebrate is pockets of freedom that are given so that individuals can start to erode the power of the totalitarian interests. And, you know, the next thing you know, 
they're going to be, you know, swamped aside. What you don't want to do is move in the opposite direction of that. (laughs) You want more decentralization, more power given to individual people, more freedom given to people, rather than the idea that I'm going to move in a direction that takes freedom away from people in the promise of something. You know, so going back to these various political actors that you were raising, this also is a, a part of Hayek's story is that in the road to serfdom, you know, there's a sort of emergence of what happens when we engage in these promissory politics, but yet at the same time, the promissory politics cannot deliver what it promises. It can't deliver the economic outcomes that it promises. So what it has to try to do is deliver the political promises to those who are its allies And that's what leads to concentrating the political privileges on a few and trying to pass the costs on to the many. And that's actually how you get the kind of road to serfdom, right? Is that this economics can't be solved by the socialist problem, you know, because socialism faces these various incentive problems and information problems. So socialist promises can't be realized but socialists in power are still going to be in power. And what are they going to do? They're going to reward their friends and punish their enemies. And then the next thing you know, the logic of that situation is such that you end up by concentrating power in a few and enslaving the masses. And that's how you end up as this tragic road. Hayek's book is a tragedy. You know, People with high ideals, high aspirations – end up by producing outcomes that they themselves would detest. They want the economic planning to replace the markets. Right. And that can't work. So therefore, politics replaces the markets. And then you get all the things that go with politics. (laughs) I could pick your mind for many, many hours in these topics. So you're still at Basin though right now. Yeah. Yeah. I've been here since 1998. It's amazing. Every time I see pictures of the campus, I'm just like, well, actually, I drove around maybe... Was it this summer? But I literally got lost. It used to be easy. You could just go in a circle <laughs> around it. And then I'm like, I'm on some highway somewhere. I don't know where I yeah. am. My wife and I, when we came to George Mason, I had a variety of choices when I was thinking about going to graduate school. My wife, Rosemary, and I, we went to the different options and thought about them. When we came to Mason, I remember, you know, our comment was that this is probably the ugliest campus we've ever seen because it was just the first, the end of the campus was Fenwick Library, if if you can remember that. And so it was all those old buildings in the front, East Building, the, you know, West, these kind of things. And since I left in 1988, I left between 1988 and 1998, they built the Johnson Center. They built up the other half of the campus and everything like that. And when I came back here in 1998, Since that time, the amount of building and development and growth of this campus is just mind boggling. I mean, it's amazing. And I'm like you, I go away in the summer. I used to go and teach in Europe in the summer and I'd come back and I'd be like, how do I get to my office? (laughs) You know, where are the roads? And it's still like this. We just built this beautiful medical center, the Peterson Medical Center. That's in the front of the campus. And it's just a very, very great pleasure to be part of this tremendous growth in this institution that now is the largest institution in the state of Virginia, and it's the largest on-campus residential college as well. I mean, we've got 37,000 students, and I think there's roughly around 10,000 living on the campus now. Hey, by the way, you should give a quick call out too, because I don't want to phrase this. You could probably phrase it better than I, but if people are interested, if they're listening, and perhaps they have kids or uh, teenage kids coming along. If those kids, perhaps in the future, want to go to a university in the States where the topics that you and I are discussing today, the Austrian school, Hayek, Mises, there is no economics department in the States where they can go where they're gonna get a, a bigger fire hose of this information than George Mason University, is there? No, I mean, there's some small colleges. Let me uh, just say that, you know, Grove City College, where I went to school, is still very, and it's a small school, 2,200, 
hundred or three thousand students. Hillsdale College, also a small college, has a very strong economics department. And Hampton Sydney College in Virginia has a, is an all male school, small college, but has very strong department. At terms of big universities, Clemson, Florida State, West Virginia University have pockets of people that people could talk to. And hold on, you guys aren't pockets. You guys are an entire army. Yes. Yeah, no, <laughs> I, I know. I'm just saying that there's these things. And then Brown University has a project called the Political Theory Project, which has very good people in that for education. Arizona has the Freedom Center. So there's options there. But George Mason, from beginning to end in the economics department has a very, very strong economics department. If you're a graduate student, what's fascinating about George Mason is that our debates are, and they're very vigorous debates, they're about the methodology and methods in the science of economics, which is what graduate students should be debating, not, you know, whether the op-ed page of the New York Times that you disagree on. So most of us in the econ department would agree that the Wall Street Journal op-ed page is better than the New York Times or the Washington Post page. But where we disagree vehemently is on how you should approach economics, how do you study it. So it makes it an extremely vibrant environment intellectually for people that are advanced students in economics. And for the undergraduate students, we start with one of the best communicators of economics one can find, Don Boudreau, my colleague Don Boudreau. And then you get an opportunity to take classes with Brian Kaplan and Robin Hansen, who you mentioned earlier, is you know, these people are just so intellectually interesting. It's an amazing opportunity for a student. So I I think as an undergraduate or a graduate student, George Mason should be at the top of your list to study economics. And the Shanghai rankings were one of the top departments in the world. It's a prestigious place to get an economics degree, and yet at the same time, it's a very unusual place. So we're both distinctive and distinguished. <laughs> I got kind of uh, lucky in a way with this podcast series that I started in 2012 that I had interviewed Vernon Smith for a documentary that I did in 2007. When the podcast series came along, I got him on here either 2013 or 2014. And the funny thing was, is that I had tried to get Daniel Kahneman to come on the show to no luck, but then I got Vernon to come on. And then I sent Daniel a, another text and said, hey, would you like to come on? And you know, he writes me back, like the most famous living psychologist in the world, right. <laughs> writes me back, he goes, hey, I liked your Vernon Smith interview, I'll come on. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah. And of course they share the Nobel Prize together, so there you go, boom. That's yeah, and Vernon is a classic case of uh, similar to what I try to do in my book on Hayek is I try to communicate the idea of Hayek as a lifelong learner who's constantly thinking new thoughts and trying to pursue new directions in his science throughout his life as a scientist. So, you know, seven decades worth of learning. That's how Vernon is. Vernon's mind is super fresh even today. I mean, it's phenomenal. He's in his 90s. I believe in the conversation with me, it was either the 30s or the 40s. He was discussing uh, events that it sounded like coming from his mouth sounded like it was yesterday to him. His mind is fresh. It's crazy. <laughs> and he's such a exciting intellectual to be around because, you know, you'd go to lunch with him and you would think he would talk about the latest paper in experimental economics. But instead, he was talking about the latest papers in science or in some anthropology journal. He's very interested in the prehistory of man. So he studies a lot about like what's going on in archaeology and anthropology and whatnot. You know, he's an experimental economist. You taught, you know, I taught at NYU for almost a decade and there's a lot of smart people at NYU, but they're much more narrow, you know, in terms of their breadth of the conversation that they want to engage in. Vernon Smith, the conversation can range anywhere. And it's just so refreshing because he is constantly exhibits the scientific attitude, which is, you know, if you take the scientist Richard Feynman seriously, he said that I would always rather ask questions that I don't have an answer for than ever provide answers that can't be questioned. And that's the scientific attitude that Feynman, that's like Vernon. He walks into a room. He doesn't pretend to be 
anything. He's the smartest guy in the room, but he doesn't act that way. He just says, hey, guys, let's all try to figure this out. And it's like this mutual learning process. And that's in some sense, uh, uh, you know, he's he's more egalitarian in his attitude than I, I don't mean that in the political sense, but in the knowledge sense, you know, than Hayek was. Hayek was more of a lone wolf. He didn't do team research. I don't think he ever co-authored a paper or anything like that. Vernon's part of that more modern age where we have co-authors and partners on our projects and everything. But they're both exhibit this amazing mind of constant learning, constant adaption, constant absorbing of how the world is changing around them and how to make sense of it. And I think that's intellectually affectious. I don't know if the science is there yet, but I have a sneaky suspicion, at least my gut says this, is that at some stage of the game, we're going to figure out our best chance, no guarantee, and obviously it's a bell curve, but our best chance for longevity is going to be using that mind as a muscle. And perhaps Vernon Smith is, uh, is exemplifying that right now today, not ever letting that mind unwind, and he's doing it at an amazing age. So it's quite, it's, yeah, yeah, it's, it's awesome. Phenomenal. And he, you know, he has other things, you know, he walks, he has, you know, certain routines, right? He walks a lot and he also watches his diet and he's a vitamin guy. And so there's different things there. There's obviously also good genes, you know, like, you know, that are, that are behind it, but you're exactly right. He has never stopped being a learner and an absorber of information. And he surrounds himself with young, energetic go-getting scientists. So his colleague, Bart Wilson, is a young economist, an amazing mind himself. And they just have a new book out called Humanomics. You know, I mean, think about it. Vernon in his 90s is now starting a new way to think about economics, which is puts the interface between economics and literature. So, you know, a lot of times people have thought about economics and psychology, economics and philosophy, economics and politics. Right. What Vernon's doing now is the connection between economics and literature, and they call it humanomics. And he's doing that. It's amazing. Anyway, he's just a phenomenal mind, and he's something that we should learn from and try to emulate. And what I tried to do in my Hayek book is to pick on those aspects of Hayek, which reflect a similar kind of mind to Vernon Smith's. But I think Vernon Smith actually might be the exemplar of that in my lifetime personally he's an exemplar of that kind of approach to academics and science the book you mentioned fa hayek economics political economy and social philosophy available everywhere i assume yes yeah yeah except that i should mention that if you belong to a university library you're able to get the book at an extremely discounted rate the publisher macmillan is in league with Palgrave and Springer, you know, then now the publishers are consolidating. And they, if you are a university student or university faculty, or you have an access to a university account at a thing, you can go through Springer link and you can either download a ebook for free through various steps that you have to go through. You got to go through the Springer link and you can also get a paperback for $25. But if you don't have that, then the book is in cloth and it's library bound and it's very, it's expensive. It's, it's a hundred dollars. This is the way that they're doing price discrimination today. <laughs> Actually, I think a, a very good study should be done on publishers and their pricing policy and what they're trying to do to go down that demand curve to extract all the surpluses. Oh, this, uh, that would be the be plan B conversation for us would be to talk about uh, my experience in authoring books since 2004. I can get a headache immediately if I think about the process. So <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a funny thing with that. My colleague, Tyler Cowan, he has very interesting things to say about the modern publishing process and everything. So it's all changing. And at some level, again, you step back from it. It's amazing to see the changes. I mean, I, I have a line in my book where I say that Friedrich Hayek could never have imagined that I could have his collected works on my cell phone, right, to call up. He could never have imagined that that would be possible. And so how is it that all this world is changing of information transi transmission? You know, you're interviewing me from Vietnam, right? How amazing is that, that this is the way we communicate information today? Crystal clear over Skype, not a penny spent yeah. by either of us. 
yeah. crazy. Yeah, right? could you imagine if we had Adam – like, you know, if, if, if we would have podcasts of Adam Smith or of, you know, Ludwig von Mises or of any of the other great thinkers, I mean, Einstein, if we could have access to that today – it's just amazing what all of this is going to do in terms of repository of knowledge for future generations, not not our interview. I'm well, you know, there's nuggets in every interview, though, that I think are prescient for me. And I, I feel very fortunate because, look, I'm just uh, an, an average guy. You kind of sound like an average guy, too. But, you know, if you, you push and push and you push, and all of a sudden you end up with a little bit of material that you've created. And I don't necessarily know that my podcast, which was started as a trading podcast, clearly is not now. I didn't know how it's going to unfold or anything like of the sort, but my gosh, I, I can't stop now because if I get a chance to talk to bright people and they can kind of educate me and make me see something that I didn't know, and my gosh, this is what we all want, even if we don't want to admit it, this is what we want. We want to learn from smart people. It's like the, you know, we all kind of want to sit down with a crazy, brilliant uncle that tells us something we didn't know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I think that the... Reality is, is that what modern technology has allowed us to do is expand our ability for learning and the speed at which we can learn. So I'm not saying that we should always substitute those things. I remember, you know, going back to your first question about where I came from and how I got interested in this stuff. You know, when I got interested in these ideas, what happened was I went to the library and I started reading. And I spent a lot of time reading, which I didn't do before that because, again, I, my interests weren't academic oriented. And I can remember the joy of sitting in the library and reading books and then having these like epiphany moments of like, oh, my God, like, can you believe that? That's how wonderful this is. And I still hope students still find that. But I think there's so many ways now for people to learn. They might find that in terms of listening to a great lecture or listening to an interview or watching, you know, some other way. And so we're learning at such a rapid and our expanse of what we can learn is so phenomenal today that the notion of what education is, is in the process of changing. And I think that's just so fascinating for us to see. Peter. I've kept you over time today. I appreciate you. I appreciate you coming on and, uh, and giving my audience a healthy dose of your world and uh, your background. Cool stuff. And hopefully uh, one day I can make it back to Northern Virginia soon enough and maybe grab a coffee or a lunch over there at the campus. Would love to host you and show you around. And thank you very much for having me here and also for uh, doing this podcast and showing that your own lifelong learning path and that we're very proud that it starts at George Mason University. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. I appreciate it. Thank you. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.